Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to Syriana Analysis. I'm your host, Kerouk al -Masyan. When you read the Council on American-Islamic Relations, you would think that it is some sort of a council that is working to advance the relationships between countries that are populated by the Muslim people and the United States, or trying to create some sort of a harmonized relationship between the Muslim communities in the United States and the other communities in the U.S., right? But what if I told you that the Council on American-Islamic Relations, in short called CARE, is actually working against the interests of the Muslims, especially in the Arabic world, in Syria, in Libya, and elsewhere? What do we call such an organization? Are they really caring about the Muslim rights and the well-being of the Muslims? Or probably they are working for other agendas and they're embedding themselves with the establishment in the United States. They're embedding themselves with the Zionist lobby in the United States in order to advance the interests of a tiny elite, but portraying themselves as a council that are here to protect the rights of the Muslims, right? This is, in my opinion, the highest level of hypocrisy. Look, I do not contempt the psychopaths in Washington, D.C. when they try to destroy Syria, impose draconian sanctions, kill and murder the people in my country. I do not contempt them because this is what they do. And they're trying to serve their own interests, right? But I do contempt the people who hold Syrian nationality, Iraqi nationality, Libyan nationality, Saudi, Qatari, whatever, from Arabic countries. And they're actually helping the establishment in the United States against their own countries and against their own people. This is when I truly contempt those people I truly contempt. I detest them. I think they're traitors. For example, you have the Cuban opposition in the United States. You have the Iranian opposition in the West. You have the Syrian opposition now all over the world. I respect them when they try to work against the government from their own funding, from their popular base, when they try to show the mistakes of the government, when they say we have to replace this government because it is doing this and that, and show the people, convince them that this government is not serving the interests of the people, right? But I detest them when they put their hands in the hands of the criminal psychopaths in Washington, D.C., in order to remove their government or destroy their country. And this is what happened so many times. It happened in Iraq. It happened in Libya. They tried to do it in Syria. And now they still continue doing it. Of course, they're doing it all the time in Iran and Cuba as well. Now we have the Foreign Affairs Committee in Congress, and they're backed by Israel and Qatar. They um, wrote an act, a law, um, the title of it is Anti-Assad Regime Normalization Act. And it was approved unanimously by all the committee members. And this act will be sent and it will put for voting in the American Congress. Now, this law says that if it's passed, which... Criminalize the Washington's normalization with Syria under President Bashar al-Assad. So it, no president can normalize relations with Syria under this law. Two, this law will criminalize the Arabic countries' normalization of relations with Syria, and it will threaten these countries with sanctions. Three, it will broaden the Caesar Act, which is another law that was adopted in 2018, the most draconian sanctions ever imposed on Syria. It is worse than they did for, to Iraq and other countries. So they will broaden it and they will increase its implementation and the scope of the implementation of this law. So all in all, it's an evil law. It targets the ordinary people. 
It targets their livelihoods. It targets their income. It targets their aspiration to reconstruct their country. It's an evil act, right? Now, who came in support for this act, you may ask? So on Twitter, this Council for on American Islamic Relations, they posted this tweet and they say, tell Congress to support the Assad regime anti-normalization bill. Click our handler actions alert below. So you have to click on it and you have to tell your Congress member that to support the Assad regime anti-normalization bill. And here they say they're America's largest Muslim civil rights organization. We protect civil rights, enhance understanding of Islam, promote justice, justice, and empower American Muslims. There are over 150. Look, my comment got more likes to 121 compared to the original tweet. Anyways, if you go through all the comments, man, over 150 comments by Muslims and Americans, they're all saying never, absolutely not, shame. This is not what the Muslims do. You have lost it. I stopped following you. No, 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 no. Everyone. I came across the tweet of Max Blumenthal of the Gray Zone, and he says, after partnering with the Israeli lobby on Biden's anti-Semitism plan, the Council on American Islamic Relations promotes a neoconservative bill to maintain sadistic sanctions that have driven 90% of Syrians below the poverty line and caused mass starvation. What a bunch of collaborators. And I agree with him. Here he says, remember when the Council on American Islamic Relations honored the Senate's biggest warmonger, John McCain, likely because he supported the moderate rebels in Libya and Syria? See, this is their original tweet from 2018. Actually, they are glorifying and they are honoring uh, one of the biggest Zionist senators in the history of the United States who had an instrumental role in the destruction of two Muslim countries, Syria and Libya. They're shameless. They are shameless. We have Aram Mate again. Aaron Mata says, Council on American Islamic Relations, which is, quote, America's largest Muslim civil rights organization, calls for supporting a congressional neocon effort to intensify murderous U.S. sanctions on Syrian civilians. They should rename this the pro-sadism normalization bill, and I totally agree with him. But what caught my attention is Joshua Landes, who is the director of the Center for Middle East Studies at Oklahoma University. And he had actually a different approach in the past years. But I think since 2017 and 18, he uh, changed his approach and he understood the core of the issue probably. And he's, he saw that the regime change was a disastrous uh, war on Syria. And now he's calling for lifting the sanctions, which is something very welcoming. And he says, he asks very legitimate questions here. Why would the Council on American Islamic Relations support sanctioning 17 million more Muslims in Syria? The U.S. sanctions are designed to keep Syria in ruins and to stop reconstruction of the country and stop foreign investment. There is no U.S. plan to get rid of Assad or his security state. This bill simply condemns Syrians to poverty in perpetuity. So it's forever poverty. Sanctions on Syria are no different than those placed on Iraq in the 1990s, which killed 500,000 Iraqis. Why would CARE support more sanctions on Muslims? Yes, they put Assad's name on the bill, but it's, it won't hurt Assad. It will hurt innocent Syrians. And I will go through some of his comments because they are very important for us to understand his logic. To understand what's wrong with this bill, you have to put it in the context of our 
current failed policy on Syria. This two-minute explanation by Dana Strull gives a good summary of the policy. I will play the clip later, guys. As Sproul says, she's actually Biden's Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. So Sproul, she is in a position of power and she says, the Assad-controlled areas of Syria are, quote, rubble, and we want to keep them that way. The legislation tries to intensify the policy and enforce it more strongly through secondary sanctions. Our policy, he means the U.S. policy, has three components. One, to actively prevent any economic reconstruction in Assad-controlled areas of Syria. Two, I will come back to two later. This is one. Economic reconstruction is different than humanitarian aid, which is essentially stuff like food deliveries and other kinds of refugee camp type charity assistance. Economic reconstruction involves everything needed for any kind of functioning economy, including power generation, electricity, repairing and building, ruining, ruined buildings, etc. As Joel Rayburn explained, U.S. sanctions emiserate irate Syrians because the Caesar Act lowered the bar for imposing them. So, two, to occupy, this is the second policy goal of the United States in Syria. Two, to occupy the one-third of Syria containing oil and gas resources with U.S. troops and to prevent these resources from being accessed by the Assad regime. This is necessarily adjunct to to preventing economic reconstruction since if the regime had control of these resources, it could supply power to the civilian economy and infrastructure as well as trade the oil for other resources. Three, to prevent any normalization of relations between Syria and the neighboring countries. Again, this is necessary adjunct to keeping Assad controlled areas as rubble. It prevents any normal civilian economy from emerging. If relations are normalized, economic interaction and investment can occur. What is happening now that surrounding countries, that the surrounding countries are getting sick of this policy and its regional side effects. These side effects include continuing refugee flows, Assad making money through illegal means, such as drug dealing, which is unproven that Assad does it, but there are so many claims that Assad is connected to some sort of a drug production in Syria, in part because legal reconstruction is cut off and the constant state of conflict in Syria. What this bill does in this, in this, is response to the Arab effort to deal with the situation by saying, no, you may not like our policy, but we are going to do it harder. It doubles down on sanctions in an attempt to assert U.S. authority over all of Syria's neighbors. They have to comply with America's maximum pressure policy to take just one example. Um, Section 4, Clause A to C of the bill requires all U.S. federal agencies to audit all citizens of Turkey, the UAE, Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Oman, Bahrain, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Libya, and Lebanon for all transactions of half a million or more intended for Syria. So the U.S. government is going to audit the financial affairs of everyone spending money in Syria to make sure they aren't trying to rebuilding an apartment in Syria. Do you think this is a wise or smart way for the U.S. to increase its influence in the region or oppose Assad? It won't hurt Assad. It is designed to keep Syria in ruins. I think this is really amazing thread by Joshua Landes. And, of course, who came for um, support of these sanctions and care in general, this, um, in my opinion, Muslim Brotherhood organization? I will show you. You remember him, Bilal Abdel Karim, this Al-Qaeda propagandist, this guy who was in Aleppo for a long time, and then he escaped to Idlib, and he is giving his platform to all the Al-Qaeda leaders, Ahrab al-Sham, all these jihadi leaders, and giving them all the platforms they need to speak their mind and talk about the beauty of their jihadi uh, mission in Syria. They speak nothing about democracy, of course. So I said the criminal psychopaths in Washington and Al-Qaeda assets are once again on the same side in Syria. This time, they want to suffocate and murder millions of Syrians with draconian sanctions. They are ghouls. 
This is Bilal Abdul Karim. And this guy, he has 76,000 followers. And actually, he was hired by CNN. And he did work for CNN and other also Western media outlets. This guy has been hired by the CNN. Let that sink in. And recently, his phone or telegram was hacked and they published photos of him naked sending uh, dick pics to women in Idlib. I don't know uh, what is he doing with that. And he thinks he's some sort of a jihadi boy coming here to Syria to spread Islam while he's working against Islamic values. So this is the video now of Dana Shul. Some of you maybe already know, guys, because I already played it a few times on Serviana Analysis, but it's important for us again to revisit it and understand what's the strategy of the United States in Syria right now and not what the Syrian opposition says or claim. Because according to the Syrian opposition, uh, these sanctions are aimed at Assad. It's not. Take a look. The United States still had compelling forms of leverage on the table to shape an outcome that was more conducive and protective of U.S. interests. And we had the United States still had compelling forms of leverage on the table to shape an outcome that was more conducive and protective of U.S. interests. And we identified four. So the first one was the one third of Syrian territory that was owned via the U.S. military with its local partner, the Syrian Democratic Forces. Now, this was a light footprint on the U.S. military, only about a thousand troops over the course of the Syrian study groups report. And then the tens of thousands of, of forces, both Kurdish and Arab, under the Syrian Democratic Forces. And that one third of Syria is the resource rich, it's the economic powerhouse of Syria. So where the hydrocarbons are, which obviously is very much in the public debate here in Washington these days, as well as the agricultural powerhouse. But we argued that it wasn't just about this one third of Syrian territory that the U.S. military and our military presence owned, both to fight ISIS and also as leverage for affecting the, the overall political process for the broader Syrian conflict. There were three other areas of leverage. One is political and diplomatic isolation of the Assad regime. So holding the line on diplomatic isolation, preventing embassies from going back into Damascus, Two, it's the economic sanctions architecture. So some of this is part of the maximum pressure campaign of the Trump administration on Iran, but there's a whole suite of both executive and congressional sanctions on Syria and Bashar al-Assad, both for human rights abuses in Syria and to the backers of Assad for their activities on support in support of him in Syria. And three was reconstruction aid. So the United States remains the overall largest single donor of humanitarian aid to Syrians both inside Syria and refugees outside of Syria. And there was some stabilization assistance in the part of Syria that was liberated from ISIS and controlled via the Syrian Democratic Forces in northern eastern Syria. The rest of Syria, though, it is, is rubble. And what the Russians want and what Assad wants is economic reconstruction. Um, and that is something that the United States can basically hold a card on via the international financial institutions and our cooperation with the Europeans. So we argued that absent behavioral changes by the Assad regime, we should hold the line on preventing reconstruction aid and technical expertise from going back into Syria. Guys, if there is, um, if I want to say um, this person represents a sadist, the highest representation of sadism this video would show you everything you need to know about the u.s foreign policy they don't care about the syrian people they don't care if they are suffering dying there is poverty and everything even if there are now increasing number of diseases in syria the emergence of some of the viruses that perished long time ago they don't care they are ghouls. They are psychopaths. They are people who would do anything for their masters in Washington, D.C. And this Council on American Islamic Relations should be ashamed of themselves for supporting such a bill in collaboration with the Zionists and the neocons in the United States. Calling yourself a Muslim? If I see you guys, I would spit on your faces. Seriously. You supported the war in Libya 
You supported now the war on Syria, and now you're supporting the sanctions on the Syrian people. You are nothing. You should be ashamed of yourself, and you're nothing but a puppet. You are a puppet for Washington, D.C. You are a puppet for the Zionist lobby there, and nobody respects you in the region. And at the end of the day, you can see clearly that there is a big shift in the balance of power in the Middle East and abroad, and we are betting on these changes. And when the dollar loses its value as a reserve currency, you all sanctions, these papers that you write the sanctions on, you can sink it in water and drink the water or put it somewhere else better. That's a better way of saying. And you know what this uh, so-called Council for Islamic American relation, blah, 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 do not speak about when the U.S. occupation forces loot the Syrian oil that belong to the Syrian people. This was just yesterday. They stole 71 tankers of looted oil and accompanied them by six military armored vehicles, and they sent them to northern Iraq to their fucking military bases. Let's see how the American occupation forces will leave Syria, and that day will happen. And when that day happens, and when that day that day comes, we will celebrate it here on Syriana Analysis. We will, I will, I will open uh, a champagne for you guys. Sorry that the camera has fallen because of, of my uh, excitement. <laughs> and we will celebrate it here on Syriana Analysis. And I will open you a champagne to celebrate that. Anyways, I've been your host, Kirk Almasian of Syriana Analysis. If you're new, please subscribe and hit the like button and share this video with your friends and show the world who are these people in this so-called organization care, especially if you live in the United States, show it to your especially Muslim friends. And if you want to also support my work, independent commentary work, please become a patron. The link is in the description below and see you next time.